Most of us remember Nathan Boynton from my series of Port Turin Past and Present. He was the head of the Maccabees in Port Turin. But most people don't realize that his father was famous in his own right, at least for a while. Uh, Jeremiah Boynton owned much of the property in the Smith Creek area. He also was a merchant there and wanted to expand the town. And he had invented a, a, a railroad of sorts. It was called the Boynton Bicycle Railway Company. It was rather strange looking compared to the railroads that we know about today because it had only one rail. I think the reason for this was that steel was quite expensive then as it is today actually and wood was much cheaper because of the lumber industry and so he made that uh, connection on top out of wood which just used one rail on the bottom. Jeremiah Boynton ran that single rail all the way from Smith Creek to Port Churn. His timing was terrible. The railway uh, ran for only well, a little over a year. But at that time, the two rail railroad was coming into Port Huron, and people liked a more stabilized uh, railroad, so uh, it was soon forgotten about. Jeremiah Boynton went bankrupt and went back to farming. Another unusual mode of transportation had a connection to Port Huron as well, and it had to do with this man right here. Born in Prescott, Ontario in 1854, Lawyer Frederick Augustus Knapp turned his passion for invention to transportation and the development of one of the strangest vessels ever seen in Canada or the United States. Prompted by his admiration of Queen Victoria and her well-known seasickness, he designed a cylindrical boat that was supposed to conquer waves of any magnitude, leaving a calm ride. He took his plans to the Wyandotte Shipbuilding Company just outside Detroit. The company dismissed the plans uh, for this unusual ship uh, as folly. The company said they didn't think it could be done, and it certainly wasn't practical. It would never amount to anything. Knapp's uncle lived in Sarnia, Ontario, and told Knapp not to be discouraged, that he should try the Jinx Shipbuilding Company over in Port Charon, which is what Knapp did. And after many conversations, uh, Jinx agreed to build this ship. The Jinx Shipbuilding Company was located on Black River, shown here, and it had become quite well known for its innovative uh, shipbuilding. It was 110 feet long with a 22 foot diameter outer cylinder for rotation and a smaller stationary inner cylinder for passengers. Using two steam engines at the ends, the boat log rolled across the water like a rolling pin, cutting through the waves with blades affixed to its exterior. Although the design was ingenious, the prototype just never reached adequate speed. It was hard to maneuver, so eventually interest in the boat ceased. In 1907, the hull of the boat broke loose from its moorings and crashed into another boat. As payment for damages, the hull was sold for $300. These next pictures you see are very rare. This is Port Charm before there was a settlement here, when there were still uh, Indians in the area. This would have been in about the area where McMorrin is now. And uh, that creek you see going through there, that's just about where Huron Avenue is now. This one here it appears that this is the only teepee that has air conditioning. Of course, that's great in the summertime, but the winter, it's a bear. In this picture, you see the chief of the Huron tribe that made their home in the Port Huron area. And uh, you're not going to believe this, but his, uh, his name was Chief Shoot Him in the Eye. You just can't make this stuff up. During World War I, uh, there were a lot of fires in Port Huron, uh, destruction of buildings. The city told the people it was just old buildings and carelessness, and they kept the truth from the people, and the truth is this. During World War I, there was a German submarine that went up and down St. Clair River causing havoc. What they would do is that they would surface for a few minutes and shoot a few rounds into the city, and then they'd submerge again. Here you see a direct hit on the Opera House. 
The city fathers realized they had to come up with a plan very quickly, and so they worked together with the Port Huron Police Department and devised a, a unique plan on how to get the submarine. The plan was to have uh, the person in charge of the cannons at Pine Grove Park, who is this lady sitting on the, can the cannon here, and that's uh, Henrietta Huckleberry. Henrietta had been uh, the Girl Scouts at one time, and part of their training was loading and firing cannons. And so she loaded all the cannons there, realizing the submarine would have to pass there at some time, and when she saw them, she fired all the cannons one after another, and one cannon hit a direct hit. The sub made it as far as the canal and uh, was beached. Uh, prisoners, of course, were taken into custody. And the uh, submarine uh, was dismantled, the conning tower, and uh, was put through Fort Chiron, uh in the form of a parade, as you can see here going down Military Street. Most of you who have been following my videos, uh, Fort Huron Pass and Present, to know that there was a racetrack at the end of Elmwood Street. But what you probably don't know is what happened during World War I. The Army needed every available horse there was, so there was no more horse racing at the racetrack. And so what to do, what to do? And so some ingenuity developed, and sure enough, this is what we came up with. Racing on wooden horse tricycles. And it drew a large crowd. It only lasted about one year. And that's when the lumber uh, industry went belly up in Port Huron, and of course wooden horses became very scarce. And so they went with this next option. They had women dress up in paper mache horse heads, and they would run around the track. And that drew even bigger crowds, and that lasted for, oh, two or three years. And then the racetrack was shut down. It reopened after World War II when a lot of the double-decker buses in England that, that were badly damaged during the bombing went on sale. And uh, the mayor of the time, Michael Jordan, bought these buses and opened his racetrack again and had races with these uh, buses. And it was a crowd pleaser. Another event that drew large crowds was the boxing matches. During the Spanish-American War, uh, most all the men were caught up for service, and so there was a lack of boxers. And so uh, someone decided, let's let the women box. Maybe that'll draw a crowd. And so they did. They put them in different classes, not weight classes, but social classes. Here's a photo of the upper class uh, boxing matches between two ladies. And these two represented the middle class. At least they knew enough to wear gloves. And of course the lower class, which is what the uh, spectators enjoyed the most. It was no holds barred. Another fact that you're probably not aware of is how the city water went from flat weight rate to uh, meter rate. And that was because of this gentleman right here who left his toilet overflowing. It took forever to get this water shut off and they lost a lot of water. Lake Huron went down three inches. It said. Uh, in the paper in the Times Herald. So it affected all the businesses in Fort Sharon, especially the car wash business. Many of you remember that there used to be a car wash on this corner, but most of you probably don't know the fact that after they went to metered water, these car wash businesses were affected drastically. As you can see here, they no longer had running water with the car wash. They just had a pool of water that everybody used. It said that if you got up to about 25 miles an hour, you had enough water splashed on your car where you could pull into one of these bays and chamois it off. The last thing I would like to share with you is this location right here. This was just south of Lapeer Avenue, not too far from the 32nd Street Pond. This is where a new elephant that was purchased by Barnum and Bailey uh, went uh, berserk and derailed the train cars uh, that were on the track at that time. It could have been a terrible disaster, but fortunately, nobody was hurt. This concludes our video, and I hope maybe you picked up a fact or two that you didn't know about Port Sharon. I hope you all have a great April the 1st.